Is it working? Yeah. Testing. <laughs> yeah, that one for I'll take it like that. Okay. I'm only playing the. I know, I'm mine is small too. I love my glasses. Yeah, it was the way last week. And the hotel, and they dropped it. And on the elevator, they dropped it down through the glass. Well, good evening, everyone. Hopefully, everyone is doing well tonight on Monday, Thursday. Uh, my task is to read scripture and have prayer, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read a little scripture, and then I will offer prayer. In the beginning, I'm going to read from John, the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then we move on down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was light, was he of whom I said, who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we all have received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. I read uh, the Gospel of John, verses 1 through uh, five, and then all the way down from 14 up to verse 18. God's word is already blessed. If we would bow our heads. Oh, gracious and merciful Father, we are so grateful, Lord, that you have allowed us to be here one more time. We're so grateful, Lord, that the church doors are open. We're so grateful, Lord, that we're able to celebrate another Monday, Thursday, oh God. We thank you for all that you have done from this moment on back to last week oh god and then what you're going to do tonight and what you're going to do in the future we're so grateful lord as the as the preachers come oh god to share your mess their messages that you have touched their hearts with we pray that we would be ready to hear and not just hear oh heavenly father but be doers also and so father we're just grateful for what you've done we thank you for sister bull and the rest of the beat to you and all the others oh god who have put this program together. And now, Lord, as we decrease, we pray to Heavenly Father that you would continue to come into us, bless us, and fill up the church house tonight, Lord, so that all would know that your son, Jesus Christ, suffered, bled, and died, and rose from the dead for our sakes. And then, Father, we'll be careful to give you the glory and honor which is due you throughout this night and into the next tomorrow. And, Lord, we offer this prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to have Sister Bull come before us in her own way. Sister Bull. Certainly thank Deacon Cornigans for doing our scripture and the prayer tonight. And we thank all of you for coming out to really celebrate Monday, Thursday. Uh, this is such a wonderful celebration. When you think about Monday, Thursday, and why we celebrate, this really was Jesus' swan song. It was his last supper with his disciples. And when you think about why we're celebrating this and why we should be coming out to celebrate 
you wonder why there are not more people celebrating Monday, Thursday, because this is such a wonderful celebration because Jesus is saying to his disciples, this is the last time I'm going to sit down with you and have a meal. This is the last time, his final message to his disciples. And when we think about that, I mean, we would all be wondering, what is he going to say? And it was at this supper that he gave, I give you a new commandment. I give you a new commandment. Why a new commandment on this particular night? He said, I want you to love as I have loved you. Because the other one said, love. But this one went a little further. Love as I have loved you. Is that what he said at that meal? And when you think about love, love is the master key that opens your heart. Love. When we start to love as Jesus has loved us. And tonight we come to really talk about the blood. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And we think about all those things. What can wash away your sin? He said nothing but the blood of Jesus. So tonight we're going to be talking about the blood. The covenant of the blood. All of our ministers that are not all of them are here, but we're looking. They're going to be here, and we're using our own ministers, and we have partnered with Hope Missionary. When we learn how to reach out to our fellow churches and our fellow laborers that we need to worship together, come together, bring down the walls. We just had that for our pastor's anniversary a couple of weeks ago. It said grace and peace. Grace and peace, pulling down those walls, those middle walls, that we can come together as the saints of God and just worship the Lord together. So tonight, we're going to move on with our program. We know that we try to start BTU on time. I remember one of the ministers at the convention said, you should never allow your program to lie. If you say you're going to start at 7, you should start at 7, not wait for the crowd. Start at 7, and they will get accustomed to you starting on schedule. So we're going to start the program. I'm going to introduce, and I'm just happy that we have the choir and our musicians with us tonight. I'm going to do all this while I'm up because I'm not coming back. Once the ministers start, that's going to be it. So we're definitely happy to have Sister Deaconess Beverly Brown from Hope Missionary. We're fellowshipping with our fellow churches. And we have our own drummer that's here tonight. And that's a blessing. And they were here on schedule. And the choir. We have a choir. And you notice we're wearing our white tonight, white and purple. We're not wearing white and red. We're wearing white and purple tonight. And there's a reason for the purple. You notice your program is in white and purple. So at this time, I'm going to introduce to you all of our preachers for tonight. Uh, we have none other than our own pastor, Reverend Dr. Darius Dixon Clark. And then we have the pastor from Hope Missionary Baptist Church, Reverend Dr. Lawrence Mosley. Yeah. And, yeah, and then we have Elder Francis Bell, one of our own. We have Elder Bruce Edmonds, another one of our ministers, and we have Reverend Xavier Goodwin, and we have uh, two young people that's part of our group tonight for the first time. They're coming out, none other than our own minister, James Smith. This is his first First time really doing Monday, Thursday, and he's only been in the ministry for a few weeks that he really announced that he's in the ministry. He's been in for a while. And then I was at Hope Missionary a couple of weeks ago. I was on an errand, and I heard this young lady. I didn't realize she was preaching that day, but she was preaching when I got there. And I said to her, Pastor, oh, maybe we can use this young lady for Monday, Thursday with someone that was missing, none other than the minister... Marie Ricketts from Hope Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. A powerful men and women of God. It's a blessing when you can see the women also along with the men. Amen, Sister Bull. <laughs> Did I miss someone? Every year I 
come with something for them. And he said, where did she get that from? But it's things about this particular night, Monday, Thursday. So tonight we're going to be just talking about the blood. But before we talk about the blood, I'm going to ask our musician that's here for the night, and she doesn't know what I'm going to say. But on the program it says, sing along. So we're going to do one song that we're going to sing along. And what about, I love to praise him. Hey, man. You lead me? first three preachers, Elder Bruce Edmonds, Elder Francis Bell, and Minister Linda Cornigan. And then we're going to have our right now choir sing. Amen. 
Let us bow our heads. Lord God, our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to let my light so shine. The light that you have given to me. I couldn't do it on my own, Lord God. But you gave it to me. I was the recipient. So, Lord, use me at this time. Take me down deep where you had me to study, to show myself approved unto you. Take me down deep, Lord God, that I can show light on this subject and at this time to your glory and to our good. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. When Sister Bull first gave these assignments out, I looked at the scriptures and I looked at the title and I was like, huh? But it was for a reason. Yes. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes. The scripture that was attached to God, the covenant maker, Genesis 1, verses 3 through 5. And I want to read those verses. Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And it reads, and God called, well, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And I said, hmm, now how can I get covenant out of this? How can I get the promise of God? How can I get the agreement of God, the contract? His promises so freely given to us. Well, we go back and we look at the beginning. Genesis, the book of beginnings, the beginning of beginnings. Not God's beginning because he is eternal. He's from everlasting to everlasting. We are the ones that had the beginning. He brought into existence this physical realm which was not there at first, but for a reason. He prepared the universe to house the earth. He prepared the earth to house mankind, and he prepared mankind to worship and to fellowship with him. So I'm looking at where is this? Where, where is the covenant? Well, he established all things and he established it that we would be recipients and he is the gracious creator of the contract because a lot of times we had no clue what was going on but he put all things in place for our good even though we had fallen short of his glory he put the contract, he put the promises that we can receive and come back into a right relationship with him. That's why the psalmist, the psalmist said, who is man that thou art mindful of him and the children of men that thou visitest him? When I look at this great big creation, like who is, who is man? But the Lord holds us dear to his heart. And the Lord says, am I a God that's near and not a God that's far off? So I come to covenant with you, to relationship with you. Yes, I know you've fallen. You've fallen short of my glory, but I made a way. I made a way out of no way. I made a way to you for you to come back into the right relationship with me so from the beginning we see that the Lord had a covenant prepared for us even though we didn't understand what that was 
but in the fullness of time, he brought his covenants to pass. And those covenants, you'll probably hear from one of these servants of the most high God that's about to speak. But I look back at those scriptures and the Lord says, let there be. So let there be light. Let there be a covenant. Let there be a relationship. Let there be a going home to glory. Let there be life and life abundantly. Let there be. And we received all of this through the precious blood of Jesus, the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. glory. Pastor Clark and all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to God be the glory. This is the 40th and last day of Lent. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity and this time that we come before you once again just to say thank you and that you bless our service tonight and the messages that will go forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The 40th and last day of Lent, a solemn religious observance commemorating passion, death, and the resurrection. The 40 days Jesus spent fasting in the desert before beginning his public ministry. 40 days and 40 nights. What is the significance of the number 40? The number 40 generally symbolizes a period of testing, trial, or probation. Overall, it's a number associated with hardships one must endure to become more spiritually aware. During Moses' life, he lived 40 years in Egypt and 40 years in the desert before God selected him to lead his people out of slavery. It's no surprise that three of the Bible's most important figures each endured 40 days without food or water. Moses fasted for 40 days. Jesus wandered in the wilderness for, yes, 40 days. 40 pops up in the Bible. Some versions say 139 times, others say 159 times. But it's all across both Old and New Testaments. So let's take a look at a couple of these events. Three kings, Hebrew kings, reigned for 40 years, Saul, David, and Solomon. 40 years is considered a generation in the Bible, a new group of Israelites that rises up, sustains itself, and then dies off. Goliath taunted Israel 40 days before David, a young shepherd from Bethlehem, I mean from Bethlehem was sent by God to defeat the Philistines. As the ultimate test of faith, these biblical greats used their fats to achieve specific goals. Moses proved his loyalty to God and received the Ten Commandments. Elijah gained instruction on how to lead the people of Israel. Of course, Jesus upset Satan's temptations during which he endured temptation. He passed the test. In each case, as they passed their tests, and most important, they gained insights into God's ultimate plans. So think about this. Studies now prove that after three to five days of not drinking water, your organs begin to shut down, especially the brain, which could have lethal consequences, including fainting, strokes, and in extreme cases, even death. Yet they all survived. Hallelujah. God's divine purpose was at hand for their life. Now let's get to the main topic. And you know the story? Noah. God flooded the earth for 40 days and nights. He destroyed every living thing on earth. Seeing that the sin of man had become too great, 
God called on Noah. But why Noah? Here again, Noah had passed the test without even knowing he was being tested. Think about this. God recognized Noah was not a perfect man, but he was a devout, sincere, spiritual believer. Just imagine being the only person out of millions or even billions in the whole world that God chose Noah and his family as beneficiaries who were to be saved. He told Noah to build an ark that could hold two of every living creatures on earth in groups of seven, as well as his family. Then God brought on the rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Once Noah and his family was on shore again, God made a covenant that he would never flood the earth again, thus reestablishing a level of trust between him and his people that had been lost since Adam and Eve. So listen what God said in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. And it says, The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to, said to himself, I will never again curse the earth on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. And if we drop down to chapter 9, verse 11 says, My covenant, or verse 9, let's go back there. Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. Verse 11 says, I establish my covenant with you and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Verse 13 says, I set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. Verse 15 says, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all earth. And God said to Noah, this is a sign of the covenant which I have established between me and the flesh that is on the earth. So I guess you know the title of this message is Never Again. God's sovereignty promises in this covenant to Noah, to Noah's descendants and to all other living things as a kind of gracious reward to the righteous Noah, the new father of the human race, never again to destroy man and the earth until his purposes for his creation are fully realized while the earth remains. Never again. When God says never again, he means never again. No doubt Noah believed God's word. One experience of the faithfulness of God leads us to trust in him even more. My life experiences help me to look back and see God's promises and judgments that have come true. How about you? It must have been exhausting to be one of eight people left on earth with a whole bunch of animals. But Noah knew he was blessed with the beginning of a brand new world. And he decided he needed a drink. So he got drunk. You read the whole story. He valued life, however, with devotional and worship time, praising and thanking God for his faithfulness. After catechismic then it, it, then it event in our life, such as this pandemic, did it help us to reestablish our priority and reestablish our devotional time? It is more important than ever to listen to God's never again and start looking for a rainbow. That is verses 12 through 16. This covenant sign was and is a visible reminder of God's covenant 
not only to himself, but to us. The rainbow doubtless existed long before the time of Noah and the flood. However, after the flood, the rainbow took on a new meaning as a sign of the Noah covenant. Remember the rainbow. Never forget God's promise. And ask, who do I care more about pleasing? God or others or myself? Do we see the world as rotten to the core as God sees it? Do we side with him? How does he see us? Think about it. Am I pleasure to him or am I a pain? Mercy, mercy, Lord. God has promised with the covenant with us never again, despite who and what we are, as we see in verse 21 of chapter 8. Don't we want to please God? Can you never, ever say never again and be a pleasure to God rather than a pain? Are you saying never again will I disappoint him? His rainbow colors our perspective. So be encouraged and remember God's promises never fail. He said, I will be reminded each time I see the rainbow of my covenant. Will you be reminded of your commitment to him? Never again. And you could take that to the bank. Thank God for your message, oh God. Thank God for today's observance. Thank you, Jesus, for passing your test and for the sacrifice that you made for us. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to be with the saints of God and to share your word. I ask, Lord, that you would use me to your glory and to your honor. Have your way, dear God, that your people might be edified, that they might be blessed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Well, I have to tell you, I went up to Sister Bull. And I said, Sister Bull, what I do to you? <laughs> How come I got circumcision? <laughs> and she assured me that I could handle it. Well, I don't know about all that, but um, I trust God. M my subject is circumcision significance. So being who I am with my teacher background, I started out with what exactly is circumcision? It is the removal of the foreskin of the tissue covering the head of the penis. Circumcision is an ancient practice. It has its origins in religious rites. And there are many cultures throughout the ancient world that practice circumcision. And to this day and in this age, circumcision is still done in many regions of the world. In some cases for religious purposes, in other cases for health purposes. Now, when is it done? Circumcision is most often performed during the first or second day after birth. However, among Jewish people, it is done on the eighth day, and it is at that time that the child receives his Jewish name. Circumcision becomes a far more complicated and risky procedure as the male child gets older, and certainly it's very risky in adults. Now, what does the scripture say about circumcision? It says a lot of things, but I have Genesis 17, 10 through 13. God speaks and says, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you shall be circumcised 
when he is eight days old, including the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money must be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. We can see from the scripture that circumcision was meant to be a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham and all of Abraham's descendants. All male members of Abraham's household were to be circumcised. The covenant established by circumcision was to be an everlasting one. Keep in mind the fact that the Abraham, Abrahamic covenant was an unconditional one, meaning that God made promises that only God could and would keep. Mm. If you want to see the actual covenant, the actual covenant is laid out in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you and all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. The actual ritual ceremony that accompanies this covenant is found in Genesis 15. Now, I'm not going to read all of that, but I just want to point out that God told Abraham to uh, sacrifice some animals, to cut them in two parts and arrange them in rows. At sunset, Abraham fell into a deep sleep. And he saw God walking through the carcasses of the animals as a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. Now, the significance of that is to reinforce the fact that this was an unconditional covenant. Were it to be a conditional one, both Abraham and God would have walked through, but it was only God. So God is making this promise to Abraham. So in summary, the Abrahamic covenant is found in Genesis 12. Confirm, confirmation of that covenant through ritual practices in Genesis 15. And finally, the sign or the symbol of that covenant is in Genesis 17. The uncircumcised did not bear the sign of God's covenant, and therefore they were cut off from God's people and God's promise to Abraham. What's important to see at this point is that circumcision was meant to be a physical indication of God's unconditional promise to Abraham and his descendants. When we look at the birth, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus, we're looking at a time when circumcision identified individuals as Jews. Among Jewish people, to be uncircumcised was to be unclean, and failure to follow the law of Moses made one a sinner. Consequently, there were circumcised individuals who had accepted Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. However, they failed to recognize the power of Jesus' blood alone as the cleansing element that removes sin. In other words, there were Jews among the followers of Jesus who believed circumcision and obedience to the law of Moses was necessary for salvation. They did not understand the nature of the new covenant that Jesus instituted when he suffered on the cross, died, and rose again in victory. Paul addressed this issue of circumcision in his letters to the churches of Corinth, Ephesians, Ephesians, Galatians, and Romans. He said, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles, since God is one and he will justify the circumcised on the ground of faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. When he spoke to the Corinthians, he said, was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. 
but obeying the commandments of God is everything. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. And to the Ephesians, Paul said, for by grace have you been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Now, what does all of this say to us, the church of today? Knowing what the scripture said, let us not put undue burdens on our brothers and sisters in Christ with our own legalistic versions of Christianity. Christianity is not a list of do's and don'ts. We should stop shooting all over brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to circumcise our hearts and seek to show the love of God in all that we do. New Christians come to the church, and some of us take it upon ourselves to enlighten them with our own personal version of Christianity. Now, what do I mean by that? We sing Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. But when the new Christian doesn't look the way we think they should look, when they don't dress the way we think they should dress, that's when we start shooting all over them. They should do this. They should do that. Instead of praying for them and with them and sharing the word of God and letting the Lord do the work in them. We think new Christians should know the rituals and traditions of the church. Who sits where? Who can and cannot approach the pulpit? How to address the officers in the church? We forget that there are people coming to Christ who have not been raised in the church, who have never spent any significant amount of time in anybody's church. Instead of demonstrating the joy of the Lord as we welcome new Christians, we walk around looking more like we swallowed a bowl of raw prunes and we act like we rolled out the wrong side of the bed. You can carry the biggest Bible that was ever printed. You can sing the greatest church hymns. You can shout and do the holy dance and run all around the church without the love and the tender mercies towards your brothers and sisters in Christ. You are no better than the Judaizers who fail to understand the gospel of our Lord Jesus the Christ. We who are in Christ should bear the circumcision of the heart. For as Christ loved us and died for us, we are to love one another. Amen. Amen. Amen.
nothing, nothing like the blood of Jesus. Anybody can testify tonight that nothing, huh, nothing, nothing, nothing can compare to the blood of Jesus. I greet you all in the mighty name of Jesus. And tonight, it is so fitting that the choir sung that song because now I get to talk about the blood. <laughs> Woo! My topic tonight um, is no blood, no atonement. And I'm coming from the scripture, Leviticus 17 and verse 11. It reads thus, for the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Would you pray with me, our Heavenly Father? You have sent for me. And so here I am. Hide me behind the cross so much so that I will not be seen, but manifest your presence in this house. Let your glory fill this place. Hallelujah. Thank you for what you will do tonight through me, your instrument. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all, presence of the Lord is in this house. If you didn't know, now you know. Mm, I feel a glory coming on. Woo! But let's, let, let's get into the word. Now, when I got accepted into nursing school, a missionary at our church said to me, Marie, the course is going to be hard, but remember something. It's all in the blood. Woo! Tonight, I'd like to come from that topic it's all in the blood. Now, I've come to realize after finishing nursing school and passing the board, after many sleepless nights and numerous pots of coffee, numerous, because I was up all hours of the night studying that if I had kept what she told me, if I had kept it in mind, the course would have been much easier because Brothers and sisters, after all that studying, I have come to realize that it is all in the blood. You see, it's in the blood of Jesus that shackles are broken. It's in the blood of Jesus that healing takes place. It's in the blood of Jesus that chains break. You see, everything you need is in the blood because life is in the blood and once there is life there is hope am i talking to a church that knows the power in the blood tonight the text tonight tells us that life is certainly in the blood william harvey ad in 1616 the year discovered the same thing i don't know how they discovered it when it was already recorded in the bible but he discovered that biological life is maintained by the blood which circulates through the brain and the body because of the heart. His conclusion is that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now that is biological life. Now let's think about the spiritual life. If life of the flesh is in the blood, where do you find your spiritual life? Ah, it means that spiritual life is in the blood. But what blood are we talking about? I'm not talking about uh, the lamb of the blood of turtle doves. I'm not talking about the blood of unblemished lamb. I'm talking about the precious blood that still flows from Calvary. Ah, the word the song says it reaches to the highest mountain. Come on, church, and it flows to the lowest valley. So we know that our blood that runs through our veins delivers oxygen and nourishment to all living cells, but it does something else. It carries away the waste. Woo! No blood, no atonement. <laughs> Life depends on blood. Life is preserved by blood. Life is nourished by blood. Now understand that if enough blood leaves a body, life leaves a body. 
Because life is in uh, the blood. Somebody talk to me tonight. No, 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 no. Because the life of a creature is in the blood, blood is what makes atonement for a life. You see, one life is sacrificed for another. The shedding of substitutionary blood on the altar makes the atonement. Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Tonight, I wish somebody was thankful for forgiveness because on the cross, Jesus took the sins of the world. And that was a bloody mess. The bloody mess called Calvary. That affords me forgiveness of my sins. Ooh. Can I confess tonight that I am a human being? I have failures. I have fallacies. I have issues. And Lord, I got problems. I'm a jacked up joker. But this jacked up joker is covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. Hey! I'm thankful tonight because the blood erases our sins. Surely somebody ought to shout right here. Because no longer we have to slay the lamb. No longer we have to kill the dove. Ah, we don't have to paint the blood on the door. Because Jesus came by and he took the place of the animals. And he said, I'm going to be the lamb of God. Which taketh away uh, the sins of the world. And now all my sins uh, have been washed away. I'm living in the newness of light. My slate is clean because the life-giving blood has been poured over me, has been flowing in me. Is there anyone on here tonight that has been grateful for the blood? Woo! Do I got anybody on here tonight that said, Lord, I thank you that all my sins have been washed away. Let me just clear this up. I'm not just talking about your past sins. I'm not just talking about your present sins. I feel God. But I'm talking about the future sins. Because when Jesus said all my sins, he doesn't mean yesterday alone. He means all my sins have been washed away. should be going to hell but the blood reached down it delivered me the blood reached down it captured me the blood reached down it grabbed me the blood reached down it took a hold of me I said the blood reached down and he snatched me up the old folks would say, he snatched me like a, bla a branch from the burning. No longer am I a slave to sin because I've been forgiven. I've been set free, but only by the blood of Jesus. I'm thankful for the blood. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus. I'm closing. I'm closing. But it was this blood. Not just blood. Of another spotless lamb. It was his blood. The only blood. That could wash the sins of man. For his blood healed my body. Set my spirit free. It was this life giving blood. Of Jesus. That redeemed it was his blood that cleansed me. It was his blood that gave me new life. It's his blood that sustains me. It's all in the blood. Ah, if COVID wasn't here, I would tell you to slap your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's all in the blood. Oh, give somebody a virtual high five and say, it's all in the blood. It's because of the blood. That I have a hope uh, that some glad morning uh, we shall see uh, 
Jesus in the air coming after you and me the joy is ours to share what rejoicing that will be when the saints shall rise heading for the jubilee yonder in the skies oh what singing oh what shouting yes it's all in the blood Do you believe that it's all in the blood? Healing is in the blood. Joy is in the blood. Peace is in the blood. Everything that you need is all in the blood. The blood. That gives me strength. From day to day, it will never, ever, 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 ever lose its power. Mm-hmm. Quite help us. It's all right to give God some praise on tonight. never lose his power. Do I got five folks in the sanctuary up in here, up in here who believe that? Let me tell you something. It's all right to have church up in here. Put your hands together for Jesus if you will.
power. No, oh, no, no. It will never lose its power. It's healing power. Oh, oh, oh yeah. It will never. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's give God some praise. Let's give God some praise. We serve a good God. Come with me to the Old Testament. Exodus chapter number 12, beginning with the 13th verse. I'll be reading from the New King James version of the Bible. And this verse reads as follows. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when you see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. For a few moments, I want to talk to you from the subject of redemptive transfusion. A redemptive transfusion. More than often, many of us, as we strive to carry the bloodstained banner, deal with struggles. And many of us deal with heartache in the midst of giving God the best we can. We also deal with negativity and persecution as we engage in the work that God has given us to do. When we come up against issues such as these, and many times we don't know what to do, and all we can do is trust God and lean on our faith. In the midst of trying to do our best and be our best, we find ourselves unappreciated and sometimes ostracized. But in the midst of it all, we must learn to trust God and grow our faith. We do our best to be attentive to the light of the world yet we find ourselves in situations that seem so dark we must learn to trust God and build on our faith in times of blessedness unexpected adversity always seems to show up we must trust God and be willing to share our faith. So we must lean on our faith. Grow our faith. Build on our faith. Share our faith. But the songwriter says just keep your faith. And never cease to pray. Just walk upright. Call him noon, 
day or night. Why? Because he'll be there. And there's no need to worry. Because God never fails. Do I got five folks that are willing to shout on tonight? Because God has never failed you yet. He has never left you nor forsaken you. Because God never fails. But let me keep it moving. There are two major components that make the blood sacrifice necessary. Number one, the fall and the sinfulness of mankind. Number two, the fact that God is a covenant making God, a covenant keeping God, a covenant revealing God, and the covenant enabling God. In covenant, my brothers and my sisters, is simply an agreement. In this case, it is an agreement between a greater and the lesser. I know y'all know who we are. The purpose, and I want you to listen to me closely, of the divine covenants is for them to be vehicles of expression of God's will and purpose to mankind. Covenants are also to be effective ways by which God's will and his purpose are fulfilled. When God created mankind, it was based on what we call the Edenic covenant because it was made in Eden. The Edenic covenant was made before the entrance of sin. This covenant involved the original man and the original woman. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Priest Larry, I'm doing doing the best I can. It reveals God's original purpose for mankind. See, they were made in God's image and his likeness. That meant spiritual, mental, and volitional. It involved the very character and nature of God. Are y'all with me? They were to be fruitful and multiply. The fruitfulness involved natural reproduction and spiritual reproduction. It involved populating the earth with the race of people that would know God, be like God, and serve God. They were also to subdue the earth. This subduing denotes warfare in that it means conquer and subjugate. This implies there is an enemy that Adam needs to conquer. Adam was to conquer Satan. They also were to eat of the herbs and the fruit. This involves sustenance for man's physical existence because eating meat wasn't allowed until the Noahic covenant. They were to have dominion. This dominion and rulership was over creation. They were to till the ground. This involves man's occupation and man was designed to work. The terms of this covenant were based on man's ability to walk in faith and obedience. Adam was given only one commandment of prohibition. He was forbidden to partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I'm going somewhere here. Understand the fact that God is a covenant making God and the covenant keeping God means that 
as the creator, he is obligated for the creation. Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 through 28. With the fall of mankind due to sin, God was still obligated by his own will to mankind, especially in the realm of redemption. This is to be fortified by the new covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. When the Edenic covenant had been violated and broken due to the fall of man, man came under the death penalty. It was sin that made the blood sacrifice a necessity. If God was going to redeem mankind, he had to put on flesh. Otherwise, he himself would be a sinner and unable to save others. The solution was seen in the miracle of the virgin birth in which God clothed himself in human flesh and was born of Mary into the human race. Man sinned. Therefore, man must die. Understand, only man could die for man. But no man born of Adam's race could ever qualify because all are born into sin. Only God can redeem man. But God cannot redeem man as God, only as man. Therefore God became a sinless man by the incarnation to redeem man back to himself by the way of the blood sacrifice. By the virgin birth, God brought forth a sinless being out of a sinful being. With that all explained, what is the importance of a blood sacrifice? When we look at the text, it lets us know the blood was tangible evidence representing an unseen faith. The blood was a sign that indicated that people had made God their choice. And last but not least, the blood was a seal to appropriate the Lord's protection from the plague. If we do these acts in faith, we will be ready for the final day. I don't know about you, but I want to be ready for the final day. I want to see here, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Dr. Clark, I want to be ready for the final day over there where there are no more hearses, no more graveyards. No more cemeteries. Every day will be Sunday. And the Sabbath will have no end. Deacon is gladden. I want to be ready for the final day. Over there, there's no more persecution. I want to be ready for the final day. Over there, where there's no more suffering. I want to be ready for that final day. I want to see him face to face. I want to be ready for the final day. See, the songwriter says, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. And I know that I know that I know
it was the blood that was smitten for me. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you over evil a victory win? There's wonderful, wonderful cleansing power in the blood. There's power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power, there's power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. The songwriter says it reaches to the highest mountain, it flows to the lowest valley. It is the blood that gives me strength. When I'm sick, it gives me strength. When I'm weak, it gives me strength. When I'm down and out, it gives me strength. When I'm up and out, it gives me strength. When I'm over there, it gives me strength. From day to day, it will never lose its power. When I'm down, I know it won't lose its power. When I'm brushed aside, I know it won't lose its power. When I'm shattered, I know it won't lose its power. When love don't love me, I know it won't lose its power. When I'm disappointed, I know it won't lose its power. When I'm dejected, rejected, humiliated, I know it won't lose its power. So what's the importance of the blood sacrifice? When we look at the text, the blood was tangible evidence representing an unseen faith. Remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The blood was tangible evidence. But number two, the blood was a sign that indicated the people had made God their choice. Have we made God our, God our choice on today? But last but not least, and I'm in my seat, the blood was a seal to appropriate the Lord's protection from the plague. Let's put our holy hands together and give God some praise for his protection. God bless you. Deaconess Bull, uh, Reverend Mosley owes me six of my five minutes. <laughs> I love you, big brother. He owes me six of my five. And Minister Ricketts owes me an entire sermon. The quiet and stole the song I was going to use in this, in this, in this sermon. So y'all act like y'all ain't heard this, all right? How many know that we serve an awesome God, amen? Oh, come on, y'all. That would be good if I said, I mean, sir, no. Denny's is an all right restaurant, but we serve an awesome God. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for the great things that you have done and the ways and proclamation that you've already come. Now, God, use me. Hide me behind your cross as I stand here behind your sacred desk. One more time to proclaim your word to these, your people. Let them not see any of me, but God, let them see all of you. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name, we all pray and we all say amen. Given 
Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 10. And for the brevity of time, I just want to look at the ninth and the tenth verse. And it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your where is Abel your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Verse 10, and he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And I want to leave this thought with you. A resolution for bad blood. Because here in the text, it says that Cain was born first. Abel, his little brother, first lady, was born second. And anybody that has more than one child knows what it's like to have two children in the house at the same time. Because right now, going on at my house, I know what Daniel and Jeremiah are fighting for right now. How come he got his tablet and I don't? How come he got some juice but you didn't? You gave me water? How come you woke him up first but let me sleep longer? How come you got him dressed and I have to wear these old clothes? How come this and why not that? Because we as children always find something to fight about. There's always some type of anger and strife and, and attitude that we seem to have. And none of that is more prevalent than found in the, in the fourth book of the book of Genesis. Because Abel gets the flock of the Lord. His father keeps him to tend the sheep and the herd. While Cain gets the field. The Bible says, long story short, that as they both come with sacrifice, and when you read it, it gives a little more description to Abel's sacrifice than to Cain's. Whoa. That smells like some trouble. And it says even in the text that God preferred Abel's sacrifice over Cain's. One thing pastors don't say is that God didn't love Abel any more than he loved Cain. And even God steps into the situation seeing the frustration of Cain and says, Look, Cain, if you keep on doing what's right, it's going to be just fine. Cain, in a fit of rage and pent-up aggression, and seeing that he always, as the older brother, gets the second hand, kills his brother, calls him to the field and kills his brother in innocent blood. And that reminds me of some canes that we got in the church. Canes in the body of Christ. Canes that get jealous. Canes in the church that live on envy and strife. Canes in the church that cause innocent blood to be spilled. Canes in the church that kill the dreams of others. Canes in the church that break the law of God, forcing the blood of the ones that succumb to their actions to be heard from the ground. Because Abel's blood is spilled and Deaconess Lane is crying out from the ground. It's crying out for vengeance and justice. And there are many of us that feel just like Abel. And though you have not gone through a physical death, you've gone through a spiritual death. A death that comes from de the derailment of dreams and broken promises. The death that comes from the hands of the one that you thought that you could trust. The death that comes when you have given the best in your service and your still soul sit down over there in the corner. The, uh, you know the canes, the one that slander your name. The ones uh, uh, that talk about you while you shout your praise. The one that gossip when they should be praying. The ones whose mouths run faster than their own feet. And here in the text it offers us a warning. To, the, to those would-be canes that God always replies to innocent blood when it's spilled. Yeah. I'll say that one more again. To you canes that are sitting in the sanctuary or logged onto, the, logged onto service, God always has a reply for when innocent blood is spilled in the church. Yeah. 
Because we serve a God that will fight our battles. We serve a God that will stand up for us when others try to put us down. We serve a God that stands on the side of justice for the marginalized and for the weak among us uh, uh, and those that are used. I thank God that he didn't leave the, our blood on the ground crying, but that he sent his son Jesus who shed his blood intentionally to give us hope, offering us forgiveness and reconciling us back to the Father. And the blood of Jesus responded to the cry. Because in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24, it reads as thus, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and of the blood sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Well, Reverend, what are those better things? I'm glad you asked. Because the blood reaches to lift me up when I'm sick. Because that, because when I'm sick, I need a healing. Yeah. When I'm out, His blood draws me nearer. Yeah. It it gives me hope in the despair due and the despair that I'm experiencing. Peace in my sorrow and joy when I'm sad, and provision when my cup is empty. But wait, there's still more. The senior saint says it soothes my doubts and it calms my fears and it wipes away every one of my tears. Huh? But wait, there's still more. Huh? It, it, it gives me strength huh? from day to day, not just every now and again. Huh? And it never loses its power. Huh? But wait, there's still more. Huh? His blood keeps me in relationship with him huh? so that when I'm acting like Cain, huh? it causes me to act right. Huh? It causes me to talk right. Huh? It causes me to give right. Huh? Because I have this blood. Huh? Because I have the blood of the one huh, that was born in Bethlehem and reared in Nazareth. Huh? I have the blood of the one huh, that walked out on the water. Huh? I have the blood of the one huh, that said to leave thy cum lie, damsel I say arise. Huh? I have the blood of the one huh, that said was walking through a town called Nain. Huh? Saw a boy laying on a funeral bier. Huh? Touched him and said boy get up huh? and, was, and showed him back to the widow. Huh? I have the blood of the one huh, that wept over Jerusalem. Huh? I have the blood of the one huh, that cried in Gethsemane. Huh? I have the blood of the one uh, that's gonna march up Golgotha's side uh, at the butt of the one uh, they put nails in his hands uh, and nails in his feet uh, crown of thorns on his brow uh, and baby that blood uh, it covers me uh, that blood uh, it keeps me uh, that blood it protects me uh, that blood uh, makes ways for me that blood uh, holds me uh, that blood uh, it guides me uh, that blood uh, it shields me uh, that blood uh, it fills me uh, that blood uh, it opens doors for me, that blood uh, kept me uh, when others walked out on me, and baby, because I had that blood, I'm in right relationship with God, because I have that blood, let me not be general, because I got his blood, uh, I can clean it over my children, because uh, I have his blood, uh, it protects my house, because uh, I have his blood, uh, because I have his blood, it keeps me my right mind. Because I have his blood. Hey, 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 because I have his blood. No money in my pocket, but provision will be made. Cause I got his blood, no shoes on my feet, but I'm clothed with his righteousness, cause I have his blood. It causes us to have the resolution for bad blood. We may not see eye to eye. But I love you because we've got his blood. So when my innocent blood was spilled, he fills me up with his blood. When I feel like I'm down to my lowest, he picks me up with his blood. When I'm sick, he heals me with his blood. When I'm down, he, he, he guides me with his blood. Because God has given us a resolution to bad blood is his blood. And I thank God because Cain taught us a lesson. Because sometimes it's all right to get frustrated. But the lesson we learned is not to spill innocent blood. 
Can I give you the last one? It's to run to the blood. First Baptist. I don't know why Sister Bull had me come in when she had me come in. I am not a fireball preacher. I've preached other places. I'm a, I, was call, I was told by uh, Reverend Larry Jennings of Bethel AME Hunting. He said, you know, a flat-footed preacher. I said, okay, I guess I'll take that as a compliment. I don't dance on my feet. I'm flat-footed. Protocol has been established. I acknowledge the pulpit uh, members. I thank Pastor Clark for giving me this opportunity to come before his flock. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we love you and we thank you on today. Father, pour into me. Holy Spirit, Effervesce your presence. Let it bubble up and bubble out. May it flow to whomsoever will receive. Father, you said in your word that you watch over it to perform it. So do, Lord, watch and perform. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So my task uh, now... Bear with me. If I go a minute or two over, I'll, I'm going to try to be obedient. The issue of blood is the right relationship. I guess I should get my glasses on so I can see what I'm saying before I forget. Isaiah chapter 1 Where's my pocket? You see, this thing is still new for me, so I haven't even found out where the pocket is yet. Thank you for that. Thank you. I need some encouragement up here. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11, and I will be reading from the English Standard Version. And if you don't mind, I'd like to just teach just a little bit. Um, I, I get a little comfortable in my flat foot zone. Isaiah 1, 11 says... What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Parenthetically, I hate your worship. So. With that as my governing premise, right relationship. I want to just establish a little context and timeline. We know God created. After that, you know, as the elders and, and clergy have said, you know, there was um, the covenant with Noah, there was the flood. The promise with Abram and Abraham. Uh, the people in, in Samuel, we want a king. We want to be like everybody else. You know, We want somebody who can go in and out before us, somebody who looks like they can be about business and about that life and can handle themselves. And if something jump off, we got somebody who can fight for us. And God says you know, to Samuel, look, Samuel, don't be offended. They, they're, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me from being their king. They don't even realize that I am their king right now. Okay, that happens. Then uh, Saul becomes king. We know that Saul was raggedy. And then um, David comes on the scene. And David, a man, hey, he was trying to kill David. David, well, Saul wasn't in the kingdom. Uh, 
a good five minutes, if he was making some uh, quick grits, they weren't even finished yet before he started slipping up. Well, you, I'm telling the truth here. So, David becomes king. God had made the promise to David, you will be a king forever, someone from your bloodline, etc., etc. Um, Solomon becomes king, the kingdom splits. You have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom is essentially uh, Judah and Benjamin, and to a lesser extent, some of um, the tribe of Levi, where the priests come from. So this is where our text kind of picks up. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah is ministering primarily to the southern kingdom, to Judah and Jerusalem. He had some uh, contemporaries. There were other prophets who were ministering at the same time, whether they were prophesying or ministering in Judah or in the northern kingdom, Israel. They were around about the same time. Isaiah prophesied or ministered under four kings, Uzziah, Jotham, or Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. I believe Hosea did as well. Amos preceded him just by a little bit. So with that, I just wanted to give some context. Uh, let's jump into the text. What is right relationship? Exodus 19, 5 and 6. You don't have to turn to it. Just hear the word of God. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Exodus 24, 30, uh, 24 3. The covenant confirmed. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All that the world, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. 24 and 7. Then he took the book of covenant. This is Moses. He had sacrificed some animals. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood that he had just slaughtered the animals and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words, the ten words, the ten commandments. We know that there are 600 and some odd commandments altogether, but they just call them the ten words. So then, toward the end of the 40-year uh, journey, while they were walking in the wilderness, Moses is at the end of his life, being a little reflective, looking back over his life, and he says, you know, he says this to the people, what does the Lord require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord. This is all part of what right relationship is. Now, I said Amos, uh, Isaiah had some contemporaries, you know, like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm, they were contemporaries of one another, speaking different messages, but, you know, they were trying to do what was good and right. So Amos 5, 21. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's what Amos said just a little before Isaiah started his ministry. What were these people, what was the nation of Israel, all the 12 tribes, what were they doing that you had multiple prophets kind of saying the same thing? They were human sacrifice. You know, God says, look, Moses, tell the people that if they obey me, you know, this, this covenant, there are some terms and conditions. There's some fine print. All that the Lord said we will do. Did you read the fine print? Do you understand the terms and the conditions? You know, you have to sit there with a magnifying glass and say, okay, yeah, well, no, I don't agree to this. I agree to this. We will do it. 
okay, when you get into the promised land, if you obey me, you'll be fine, you'll be blessed, you can stay. But if you disobey, you know, you ain't got to go home, but you got to get up out of here. Wow. You will get evicted. So, Isaiah, he says, basically, I hate your worship. Amos, I hate, and I'm not paraphrasing, that's what the ESV says, I hate. I despise your feast. I despise your worship, your sacrifices. Hosea 5 and 6. With their flocks and herds, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn from them. They have dealt faithlessly with the Lord, for they have born alien children. We know Hosea. God says, go and marry a wife of whoredom. And so she, he does, and she gives him his first child, but then the, the rest of them ain't his. He says, and he names them not mine. That's literally what their name translates. Not mine. Uh 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 uh. Not mine. Whatever the, the products of what you have done does, does not belong to me, God. Y'all did that on your own. Don't put that name on me. That's what God is saying. So, they have born alien children. Hosea goes on to say, chapter 6, verse 4, Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Obedience is better than sacrifice, but y'all want to just come and worship me any old kind of way and y'all are not living right? I hate your worship. Don't bring that to me. I don't want it. Keep that. Give that to your fake God, your fake idolatrous God. Don't bring that to me. I don't want it. Micah 6. Hear what the Lord says. Micah, he was a little, he was still ministering the same time as Isaiah, but he was just a few years short of that. Hear what the Lord says. For the Lord has an indictment against his people. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? This is God asking a rhetorical question. What have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me with an exclamation point. I brought you up. I'm paraphrasing now. I brought you up and I redeemed you that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord, that you may know, that you may understand, that you may comprehend, that you may perceive, that you may experience me. Wow. To know means to, to experience. Adam knew Eve. He experienced her. Somewhere in Psalms it says, you know, search me, O Lord, and know me. Search me and experience me, God. I, I plan on preaching that one of these days. What does it mean, you know, God says, I do, I do all these things that you will know me. Well, okay, God, I want you to know me. Well, God knows everything. Nevertheless, still, I want you to experience me. Yeah. There's a sermon in there somewhere. I do all these things, so these righteous acts, so that they would know me. With what shall I come before? Now, this is the response, Israel's response. When God says, you know, how have I wearied you? What have I done to you? They say, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Shall I give my firstborn? Wait a minute. Human sacrifice. We're back to that again. And you still want to come and worship me? And you want to just worship however you want to worship according to your own rules and not according to what we agreed upon? In the Y'all are trying to change the rules in the middle of the game. You can't do that. No, you don't get no do-overs. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Okay, Brother Smith, well, that's all Old Testament. That's fine and well. What does the New Testament say? Before I sit down. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sacrificed and has outraged the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
This is the word of God. I'm just letting the scriptures speak. So, back to Micah. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require? Now, Micah basically, he just took what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 10. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and walk humbly with your God? So, two more scriptures and I will take my seat. Isaiah 1. Well, let me just read this. Isaiah 1, 16 through, I guess, about 19. And again, I'm reading the ESV. Wash yourselves. Because it's not all bad news. There is some good news. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead with the widows. This is good relationship. This is right relationship between us and God. If we do these things, Micah said, I told you what is good. Just do justice. Love kindness. And walk humbly with your God. That's right relationship. Uh, let's see. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. We're learning about that in Sunday school. The communion passage. You're going to come. Now, if you, if you read 1 Corinthians, it's the haves and have nots. There's division. There's schisms. There's some chaos in the church. You're going to come before me. This memorial service where we recognize what Christ has done for us on our behalf and you still want to be divided at the communion supper? He says, no, let a person examine so, them. So that's right relationship. Yes. Philippians 2, 4, and 5. Let each of you look not only to his own interest but also to the interest of others. Let this mind be in you. That is right relationship. Yes. Romans 12 and 1. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, yeah. holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So, present your body. Present your existence to God. That is reasonable. That's the least you can do. That is right relationship. Yeah. Then you can come and worship God and ball and do cartwheels all up and down the aisle or whatever you need to do to get your praise in. But don't come before him any old kind of way thinking that that is acceptable because it is not. Amen. Christ Jesus died not for us to just treat him commonly. He is uncommon. Yes. So as I take my seat, don't trample the blood of Christ Jesus underfoot. Do you have regard for his blood? Amen. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in your sight. We ask these blessings in your Son, even our Savior, Jesus, who is both Lord and Christ, we pray. And all the people of God say it. Amen. 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 And amen. I have been in pastoral ministry for 27 years. I've been here at First Baptist for 10. And I'd like to announce to the would-be candidates that have preached this evening <laughs> that First Baptist Church of Bayshore, according to the chair of the deacon board, is not currently looking for a pastor. I appreciate all of these preachers and the powerful way that they have presented themselves. Uh, Sister Bull, you may not know this, but in chemistry, there are elements 
that are called buffers. And these buffers are used to equalize pH from alkaline to acidic. I am glad that you used Minister Smith as a buffer between the acid <laughs> and the alkaline. <laughs> Being the caboose on this train, and I have the last two, and if y'all would allow me, I'm going to combine them both. Uh, and so I'm going to flow right from one to the other one, and then we're going to move right to the Lord's Supper because everything has been covered very thoroughly tonight. And one of the blessings of coming at the end, you can wrap all that stuff up and take a little bit from over here, a little bit from over there, a little bit from, you know, and, just, and say ditto and sit down. <laughs> Um, the two scriptures that I'd like to share, Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 through 18. Reading from the Revised Standard Version. Then I heard a loud voice, this is in Revelation, in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. Is not the cup of blessing, I'm sorry, is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing of the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. I want to talk this evening from the subject. Initially, I wanted to say, be mindful of the line. But I changed that as I was listening to these preachers. And I want y'all to, to recognize this. Don't cross the line. A little stronger. Don't cross the line. When I was um, a young lad in school, I was somewhat uh, a troublemaker. And from time to time, I would be picked on by others. And many times I would find myself, uh, according to Judge Judy, uh, in a kerfuffle. Just before the kerfuffle would break off, somebody would draw a line on the ground. And that line, the drawing of that line would be followed by the statement, don't cross the line. Beloved, tonight, the word is clear, don't cross the line. Because Revelation gives us the results of what happened when the devil crossed the line. Hello, somebody. The, the line runs from Genesis to Revelation. You've already heard tonight the significance of this line and how it has run from every book in the Old Testament through the New Testament 
and we hear the final impact of this line, this bloodline here in the book of Revelation. For the accuser has been defeated. The accuser has been thrown down. Beloved, tonight as we consider this line that runs from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end, from Alpha to Omega, there's three things that I want you to understand about this line. The first thing in the Old Testament gives us about this line is that the line of blood represents covering. It represents covering because in the Old Testament, because Jesus had not come, the covering could not indwell us. It could only cover us. We were born in sin because of the acts of Adam and Eve. Sin entered into the world and defiled what was innocent blood or innocent relationship with God. Adam and Eve inevitably crossed the line, and because they crossed the line, they were sentenced to eternal death and eternal separation from God. But I'm so God, I'm so glad that even though they were uh, plagued with this eternal separation from God, the loving, graceful God that we serve still watched out for them, still provided for them. Hello, somebody. Although he drove them out of the garden, he still gave them strength to carry for, care for themselves. He still blessed the earth that the earth would produce for them. And he gave them the strength to wade through and pull through the weeds and the thorns to get the blessing that God had for them. God's covering was on humanity, even though Humanity sinned and disobeyed God. The line of covering covers you and I even today because none of us are perfect and we still sin and come short of the glory of God. The revelation tells us that the accuser, or can I use the King James word, the enemy, has been defeated. But y'all, I want to tell you today that I'm glad that the covering also covers the enemy. So y'all missed that one. The line also covers the inner me. See, we always want to point the finger at somebody else. But the real inner me is inner me. Oh, hello, somebody. Listen, uh, Paul said, when I would do good, evil is always present with me, not beside me, but in a me. And we are covered even from the internal enemy. The internal enemy has been defeated. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But powers and principalities and the enemy cast down images in our minds that affect us. But I need you to know that you are covered by the line. But not only does the line cover us. Oh, I wish I had some time. I'd talk about David's covering. I'd talk about um, Saul's covering. I'd talk about the covering upon the prophets all in the Old Testament covering. But see, that covering was not enough. We needed another line, a line of connection. And when God got to the covenant with Moses, he said, I'm going to deliver. I've covered them while they were in slavery. I've kept them while they were in bondage. But now I'm going to bring them out of bondage and I'm going to create a connection with them. And the connection is going to be this line of blood. He says, tell them on the night preceding their deliverance. Oh, God Almighty. On the night before you're getting ready to get blessed. Deacon Younger, I feel this thing coming. On the night prior to, on the eve of your breakthrough, you're going to have a trial. On the the night before the dawning of your new day, the enemy is going to come. But you've got a line. 
And you've got to take that line and you've got to put it on the entrance to your dwelling. You got to put it over the sides and the top of the entrance to your home. Now, unlike us, the Jewish homes only had one entrance. Somebody's going to get this in a second. So everything that came in and went out came through the same door. Just like the gates to the city. Uh, Lazarus was laid at the gate of the rich man's house. Why? Because all of the blessings had to go through the gate. Y'all don't hear me in here. God says to Moses to tell the children of Israel to draw a line around the entrance to their dwelling place. And that line is what the bullies would say. Don't cross the line. And God is saying to the enemy, don't cross the line. Now, if y'all have watched this time of the year, the cinematic version of the children of Israel, there's some real interesting drama that goes on, and the drama is real. Because while there is death outside of the door, there's some folk in the house that wants to look at what's going on outside that. There, there is an interest on the inside of us on this side of the blood, on this side of the line that wants to peek out and see what's going on on the other side of the line. Sister Martha, they're playing some nice music on the other side of the line. They, they've got some red solo cups on the other side of the line. There's something happening on the other side and we want to be curious. We, we don't want to dive into it. We just want to take a... But I stopped by to tell you tonight, don't cross the line because the line represents your weapon. Ah, I'm, I'm in the text. I'm in the text. The, 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 the line represents your weapon. You don't fight. Your weapon fights for you. The blood fights for you. We've got a praise because we've got a weapon that is fighting for us. I wish I had some help in here. I've got a weapon that's able to deal with whatever trial, whatever tribulation, whatever storm is coming down the road. I don't need to look out, pick up my phone and try to get a video because I know that my God has my back because God has put a line around me. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means they're not mine. They're spiritual weapons that God has instituted, watch this, for the tearing down of strongholds, y'all. There's some strongholds outside the door. There's some enemies outside the door. There's some persecutors and some perverts and some pedophiles on the other side of the door. But if you are a child of God, if you are covered by the blood, you don't have to worry about what's going on on the outside because greater is he that is within me than he that is in this world. I wish I had five folk that could shout today that the enemy in me has been defeated. The line, the line does not end at Calvary. It goes through Calvary because there's a covering, there's a connection. But Brother Vaughn, lastly, there's a crown. Hello, somebody. If you're on the other side, if you're on this side of the line, 
you've got a crown waiting for you in the morning. Because in the morning, you'll be able to walk out into a new day. You will walk out with power from on high. And there's some folk right here today, including myself, that we've been through some stuff. We've walked through some stuff, Sister Sharon. I, I noticed some other folks. We've walked through some stuff. Why? Because there was a line around us and the stuff that seeped in, the, the stuff that got in uh, through the side window could not prosper because the blood still works. Uh, the blood still has uh, its power. The blood of Jesus uh, never fails. Uh, and the significance of the blood is I've got a crown. Uh, I've got a praise. Uh, even in the midst of my bondage. Uh, even in the midst of my trial. Even in the midst of my tribulation. I've got victory uh, because he died on Friday. You bring him up on Sunday. He died on Friday. So that that line could be drawn. See, the only reason why Satan is fighting us because he knows his time is running out. But his tactic is this. He wants to know how much you know about the line that's around you. Watch this. If you read Matthew chapter 4. When he tempts Jesus, he's really trying to see where Jesus is. He does the same thing to us. You stand up and you shout on Sunday morning and you run all around the church. Do you really know him? Or do you just know of him? Do you know of the blood? Or do you have? See. As I close, we have a security system. The one here at the church. And when we leave the church, we set the alarm. And it's almost like when you set the alarm, a perimeter goes up around the church. And when someone comes and breaks that perimeter, the alarm goes off. Where's my towel? Because I'm running now. The problem with the alarm, it only alerts. It, it only acknowledges the fact that someone has crossed the line. Matter of fact, when I come in and I open the door, the alarm starts beeping. And if I don't put in the right code in a certain amount of seconds, the alarm is going to go off and somebody is going to be notified that something's wrong. I'm so glad that my covering and my connection is not just an alarm. It's not just something that announces something is wrong for the blood not only covers me, but the blood through the connection also saves me. In other words, when the attack comes, the blood turns into an offensive weapon. Watch this. A shield ha, is a defensive weapon. It kind of uh, uh, allows stuff to bounce off. All of us have a shield, a defense, but I just don't want a shield. I want a sword. Can somebody shout in here? I want a sword because a sword is an offensive weapon. You can go on attack with an offensive weapon. I'm so glad that the line is not only a line of defense, but it's also a line of offense. And it's always working, Deacon Young and I, on my behalf. It's always looking. It's always searching, not only on the outside, but Pastor Bishop a uh, moderator of Suffolk County is also working on the inside of me uh, because every uh, now and then 
when um, the enemy uh, rises up uh, and I'm so glad uh, that the blood uh, the blood of Jesus uh, attacks the enemy uh, and I'm able to look to the hill from which cometh uh, all of my help uh, all of my help comes from the Lord. Is not this cup the cup that we share the blood of Jesus that was shed for you and for me? The collective salvation of humanity is in the cup. And in that cup is the new covenant that goes beyond covering the exterior but moves into the interior and begins to transform us into the image and the likeness of Jesus. It does not yet appear what we shall be like. But when he appears, we shall be just like him. Changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Jesus on that Monday Thursday says to his disciples, take, eat and drink this. Watch this. In remembrance of me. Y'all, we remember his death, we remember his suffering. But what I want you to really take from this Monday Thursday is that the suffering Jesus endured, the betrayal that Jesus had to endure, the denial that Jesus had to experience, he did it all for us. If you could think just for a moment, we should have been hanging on that cross. But Elder Xavier, the scripture says it this way. Those who were dead in trespasses and sin has been quickened. Ha! Ah, made alive. Are there alive folk in here? Any blood running warm in your veins this evening? Hallelujah. Come on, we are covered by the blood. We have the blood running warm in our veins. It connects us to a powerful God. And one day, we shall wear a crown. But the good news is, I don't have to wait to the end to walk in my victory. Because of his blood, we are all ready victors in this spiritual life. Hallelujah. Our name is written in red in the Lamb's book of life. You are covered, you are connected, and you will be crowned by Jesus, our big brother. Let's pray together. God, we thank you. We thank you for what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard, especially what our spirits have felt. On this Holy Thursday, thank you for bringing us together physically here in the sanctuary of our brothers and sisters from Hope. We also thank you, Lord, for those who have tapped into this worship experience, Visa technology and live stream. We thank you, God, for those who have come from near and far to be in this worship experience tonight. Thank you, God, for every messenger that you brought behind this sacred desk. Thank you for the message that you orchestrated and delivered through them. We pray, Father God, that you have made us receptors, that we can receive the word that you have given us today. But unlike children who push vegetables to the side, or even underneath the table. Let us take the good and the bad, the bitter and the sweet, 
so that we might be made full in you. We ask your blessings upon us, upon the ministries of these, your servants, and the ministry of First Baptist Church of Bayshore. We thank you in your son Jesus' name for the blood, the power of the blood of Jesus that we experience each and every day of our lives. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray, and all the people of God said, amen. As we prepare to enjoy the communion experience, the Jews had gathered into Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. It was a festival. It was a great big feast. Uh, Minister Smith, there's a lot of drinking and partying going on because they were remembering what God had done. In the midst of that celebration, Jesus introduces a solemn, sacred meal. For them, it was symbolic of what was getting ready to happen. For us, it's symbolic of what has already happened. Hello, somebody. And so, whether it's the first Sunday or as often as you come together, Jesus has said, do this in remembrance of me. You're not going to get drunk. You're not going to get full. Because it is a symbolic experience. The real meaning of the meal is to reflect and remember what Jesus has done. Hello, somebody. That's why Paul said, before you come to the table, examine yourself. Examine your motives. Examine your intentions. I know y'all talking about it in Sunday school. But really think about it. I know some people say it's about getting right, things right with other people, but you know what? It's really about getting things right with you. You and God. Because he says, if you don't get you right, then you're eating and drinking damnation to yourself. That same night in which Jesus institutes this Last Supper, there's a lot of confusion and consternation and confrontation going on around the table. Because Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. They begin to examine themselves. Is it I? Is it I, Lord? Is it I? They didn't say, was it Xavier? <laughs> is it Pastor Mosley? Is it Brother Smith? No, they didn't say, that. is it I? It's self-examination. The moment of the introduction to the passion of Jesus Christ. That's what we commemorate. The passion. The shedding of his blood. The burial of the body. And y'all know what happens after that. But deacons, if you could come. Paul says these words in 1 Corinthians. I deliver unto you what I first received unto myself. Talking about knowledge. That the very same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which was broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and after giving thanks, he declared unto them that this is a cup my blood in the new covenant, the new testament that I make with you. I'm not going to do this again on this side. But I will do it again on the other side when we all come together. But until then, as often as you come together, do this in remembrance of me. What can wash away my sins nothing but the blood 
of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Singing, oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. you to serve that side and I'll serve this side. Just the ministers, everybody else has theirs. The people have theirs. Gracious and eternal God, our Father, we thank you and we bless you for the privilege that is ours to come to this holy table as we reflect and remember that first Monday Thursday, we celebrate the life, the sacrifice, and the passion of Jesus. We follow his commandments and do this as often as we come together. But before we engage, God, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins our individual and our corporate collective sins. Forgive us of our sins of commission and omission. Forgive us of our sins of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Forgive us, Lord God, and wash us, present us faultless, that we might eat of this bread and drink of this cup. And that may it be in us as rivers of living water springing up even unto everlasting life. We ask these blessings in your Son, even our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. By the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. By the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. By the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. now your blessings upon this bread that as we partake it that we would be reminded of your passion after he had blessed it he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which was broken for you hallelujah thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. Eternal God, our Father, we ask your blessings now upon the symbol of the shed blood of Jesus. 
the line that the devil can't cross, the line that covers us and connects us and will ultimately crown us victorious. Bless it, Father, that as we partake of it, it will be in us as rivers of living water. And he gave it unto them and said, take, drink. This is the blood of the new covenant I make with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Again, we're grateful for all of you who have come out tonight to share in this experience. I know I'm going to get in trouble, but we're grateful to God that all the way from down south, Deacon Charles Younginer is in the house tonight. He called me earlier and said, I was going to stop by your house. I said, what you mean you're going to stop by my house? So good to have him in town tonight and here in our service we're grateful to my friend and my brother uh, for his presence. Amen. Amen. And members of his church, uh, we are grateful for the choir tonight. Amen. Amen. We're grateful, Sister Bull, for your presence and all that you do. We're also grateful for our musicians, our very own drummer, our organist. She's ours. We just share her with hope. <laughs> oh, you thought it was the other way around? <laughs> uh, we're grateful for this collective fellowship. We're Amen. grateful that even in a time of pandemic that we can come together and have collective collaborative worship. We're grateful for our deacons. Amen. For their presence. We're grateful for our sound tech who ran from work, amen, to get here. And I don't know if you saw it, but slides were going up as each preacher got up. And we're just grateful for their presence and all that they do on a regular basis uh, here in the church. We give God all the glory, all the honor, and all of the praise to our trustees, to our, uh, Brother Cherry, uh, for his presence opening up so that we could have worship tonight. If I forgot anybody, charge it to my head and not my heart, because you know I love you. Amen. Our trustees. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. And all of the uh, BTU students on live stream, uh, I saw you. I was watching that you was watching. Amen. So, Sister Bull, they were watching tonight. Amen. I didn't take attendance, but I know they were there. Amen. Uh, we praise God for all of you. We pray that you have been blessed. We pray that as we go into Good Friday, that you would not forget the passion of Jesus. Amen. That you would not forget that for us to enjoy the resurrection of Sunday morning, we have to have a Good Friday. Let's pray together. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. And that we go with the spirit of expectation because of love. Mm. So, Lord, we ask you to be with us as we prepare to leave one another. Mm -hmm. If our trustees could come, we'll have a table here. If you would just come around and leave an offering tonight. Amen. See, I like family that come with money. Pastor said, 
we got a check from Hope tonight. Amen. Our trustees are coming as we leave this place. God has spoken. Lord, bless these gifts as we bring them. Bless both gift and giver that it might be used for the continual upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you come?